Seems like there's a pattern to me today. Uh, you mentioned Eagles. Uh, Eagles are very significant. They, they, to me, they're very. They're a sign of the prophetic. And uh, the reason I say that is because uh, back in I don't know the 2010 ish area. No, probably 2007. 2008, I partnered up with a man and a couple other people, and uh, number one, we were meeting every Monday at the Capitol and praying. Uh, we did that for a couple years, and um, in that, he, he said he felt like it was our time to stop meeting at the Capitol and venture outside. We were praying for our city, our state, our nation. They had a chapel in there. We would meet every Monday. And... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. So we, we started venturing out, and the Lord had us to do some prayer walking in Springfield. Going to, number one, we started uh, circling and walking and praying around the Capitol complex, all the main major branches of our government, state governments right there. Then it started taking us out to uh, the federal building and into the county building, and you even walked with us once years ago. Um, so as we were doing that, uh, he started getting a, a, a vision and a, uh, a hunger. He started mapping out places in our county where we needed to go and pray and where maybe blood was spilled. Uh, you know, there were some major, uh, one of the biggest racial riots right here in Springfield, Illinois, back in the early turn of the century, 1900s or so. Uh, so there was stuff like that that needed to be dealt with. Uh, and then it took us out even further, and we were going to places like uh, uh, the trail of uh, Al Capone and the organized crime and the speakeasies and all that. So we, we ended up spending about two years covering central Illinois over with all what the Spirit of God was leading us to do. And the reason I, I bring up the Eagles is that um, what we did, now this may sound crazy to some people, but... The Bible's laced with stories of craziness and what God would have people do, right? And he still, he says that, you know, we will look, the King James Version says peculiar at times, you know, that the English has softened it up and said special now, so it's, you know, I, I kind of like peculiar myself. But anyway, so what we started doing is we started going to all the major arteries, all the major byways and highways, the major, you know, interstates, highways of the day, Route 4s, you know, those were the major access points and, and railways in and out of our county. And what we did is we would go to those places and we would jump out of the truck or van on the interstate, let's say, where, where the border of Sagamon County and Macoupin County was, as we're all familiar with that one. And if you go down to Farmersville and back and forth, you see it all the time. So we would get out, we took re-rod, about 16 inch re-rods, reinforcement rods, and we spray paint with an epoxy paint, and then we uh, put with permanent marker scripture references. We'd jump out, we'd hammer that down in between, in between the signs, we were thinking of mowing and those things coming up, you know. And so, so we'd dimple them things down about five or six inches in the ground. We'd throw three stones in there, we cover those stones with anointing oil and dash them with salt. Okay? Now, that is what Joshua had to do many times. Okay? Is it resurrecting an altar? Now, one of the reasons I say is as we were starting to pray, as we started interceding for Springfield, Illinois, and, and uh, then the, the county and the state and all that, is I used, my church was in Girard. And so every twice a week, sometimes three times a week, I was leaving Springfield, going down to Gerard, coming back, and I always felt an oppression, a heavy oppression in Springfield. Uh, especially, I think it's just because of all the way we were, I was interceding for uh, our state government. And there was just like a spirit of death, you know, over it. And then I'd leave, and I'd come out of Sagamon County, and I'd, I'd feel peace. And then I'd go down and have church, worship, get a good word, come back in a good mood, and then, <laughs> It really felt like sometimes there was just a, like that deep groaning of the Holy Spirit that he talks about. And <clears throat> so we began doing all these things with the byways and the highways and the railways. And that, uh, it seemed, it got to the point as we were doing that, 
And I mean, then once we did that, we'd stand and raise our hands and give this ground to the Lord, you know, and trucks and cars honking their horn as we go, because there's these two idiots, you know, dashing with salt, and, you know. And yeah, we looked peculiar for quite some time, but, you know, he was a, he's a, he, he found Jesus in a foxhole in Vietnam, and his testimony is something else. And so I had the utmost respect, and I'm like, if he can do it, you know, I'd fight by his side in any war, man, with that guy, so I, I can look stupid too, okay? So then it started to get to where wherever we were driving, we would see, I, I saw more and more of these red-tailed hawks. And sometimes even when we ventured out bald eagles. And every time I noticed, every time I seen them, it was right where we had an altar. You know? So it was speaking to me. That we were, God was directing us and, and pleased. And, and the, to me, the, the, the prophetic eagles and hawks were telling me that the very warring angels and the guardian angels and the ministering spirits we called down at those points were there. Okay. He also speaks to me with deer. I don't know why. Wow. That's what he does. He's living on. He's got lots of them. But one of the reasons why is, as I said, it seemed like um, that there was a spirit of death, that something that would leave me when I left Sagamon County and then come back and oppress me I don't know if it was oppression. I really believe it was the Holy Spirit. Just saying, we're not done. I was discerning. And <clears throat> so after we got done with pretty much all that, we were at our final point, and we were doing all the railways that came in. And one of the railways was on the county line between Verdon and Macoupin County and, and Sagamon County. It's right off, uh, side, right off the uh, Route 4 and right, off, right by Verdon by the old water tower. The road's called, you know, the county line road or something. And so we, we would find ourselves went to that railway, and we got out. The railway was easy because there was nothing ever around there. <laughs> so we established an altar. We, we, we gave it to God and, and did all that. And I smelled a, a, a stench of death as I was hammering that stake in the ground. And I looked, and about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet away was a carcass of a deer. It was pretty fresh. It didn't look like it had been eaten or anything like that. So, uh, but, and I remember seeing it was on the Macoupin County side. And at that time, Earl got a word. He said, we're supposed to venture out to all the counties that surround our county. We have to, we have to pray over their county seats. So we went to all the counties that touched and surround Sagamon County, went to the county seats, and we went to the courtyards of these, uh, you know, Macoupin County, all these other ones. We're right in the middle of the yard. No cops ever came, question, nobody questioned. We wouldn't try to hide. We would just sneak out and do it. You know, run back. We'd walk up there with a stake. Did it to the Capitol, too. Pound that stake in the ground. We knew it was going to. I mean, how, how long can you get away? Two years doing this, and we got away. We never got pulled over by the police or anybody ever questioned us. Why are you staking re-rods in our ground? <laughs> you know, um, probably illegal somehow, but, you know, we were just being obedient and, and trusting. Like when Moses was called up to the mountain. You know, he heard a voice in his head just like we hear. And he had to decide for a step of faith and climb that mountain that he was going to hear from God. So you do. And so we did that. And at, at that point, we knew we had to go to these counties. And now, when we came into Sagamon County, that oppression, that, that, that thing, that discerning thing I had was gone. And now I started feeling it in other places. So we started following that. And we mapped this place out for two years. It took us two years to do all that through every county that we uh, did surrounding our county. And it was funny, that day we saw that dead deer in Macoupin County and, and got that word that we were to continue on what we're doing, but venture out. Uh, he got a word saying we're supposed to go to Sacred Heart Griffin School in Springfield. And so we immediately, we were almost done, so we drove back into Springfield and we went right there and it was, it, school was in session, everybody was in there, there was cars everywhere. He says we're supposed to go around back. Uh, so we went around back, and we got around the back, and there was, uh, they had their baseball field back there. And there was like five to seven deer grazing in the baseball field. And they were all alive. And he said, you know, our mission was complete. So the deer was showing the spirit of life in Sagamon County, so we started venturing out where we followed that spirit of death. So the deers were very significant to me because of that. Well, then we moved to Pawnee. And... As much as they still speak to me, they also like to run into my cars and get run over. Because we've been here five years and she's hit one and I've hit one. 
Well, I actually want to hit me. And uh, so anyway, I was, I was going through my, uh, uh, when I knew I had to preach today, I was like really, I just, I've been in a dry place this whole quarantine time. Really trying to search out, going, God, I mean, I've written songs, but in this time, you know, saying, Lord, you know, what's going on here? You know, it's, it's funny that one song we sang, uh, I wrote it five years ago. Um, uh, it's it was a song that's short lived. It's just a it's like I heard Jesus singing it to me. But it says that uh, this was five years ago. It says that this world is growing dark and violence lurks behind it. So we were in dark when I got this. We were in the darkness, but there wasn't really any violence at that point. You know, not the not the way we're seeing right now. The violence we see right now is different because it makes no sense. It's full of hypocrisy. It's just, it, you know, we, we all know that it's the work in the spiritual realm that's behind this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's when we praise God, and that's how we defeat and, and the powers, the principalities and powers of the air, right? Yeah. By worshiping and praising and continuing to confess the word of God. That's our fight. Mm -hmm. and, and so, anyway, I, uh, I noticed that Number one, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna do this, baby. I'm gonna do. It. Go for it. All right. So one week into quarantine, now you guys have your relationship with your father, and I have my relationship with my father. He knows how to talk to you. You told me go ahead, and he knows how to get through to me. So first week of quarantine, I just said, Lord, what is going on? What is going on? Is this is this the time that you should be blowing your trunk? <laughs> Am I gonna should I be listening? Yeah, we all should, but, you know, I mean, man, we're getting close because this perilous times are getting perilous, yeah. for real. And <clears throat> I get down praying, and I, and I <clears throat> get quiet, close my eyes, look. I always see when I feel like the presence of God is around when I'm worshiping. I keep my eyes closed half the time because God shows me royal blue purple color in my when I do that and, I, and the anointing is bubbling in me and I, I just see it I've always just, I've always kind of depended on this for, for 20, 20 years now and and so I, I prayed that prayer I hadn't seen that I'm like okay maybe I gotta maybe I gotta tense up tighter <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I see two letters and they were B and they were S you can tell him later. B and S. BS. What's going on here, Lord? BS. Well, I'm trying to be polite. Because we're all adults, but there is some younger ones here. Barbara I go to my wife and I said, you know, I've been praying today, and the Lord, I asked him what's going on with all this, what's behind all this. And he told me, but yes, you think he would do that? Yes, I mean, that's not God. And she goes, absolutely. That's how he gets through to you. He knows how to speak to you. So then I wasn't sure about that, so I called my sister-in-law. I'm like, or I asked her the next time I saw her. She, I didn't even get to that whole thing. I'm like, hey, God, show me. Be oh, absolutely. I know that's how he has to talk to you because you're thick-headed. He needs to talk like you talk. So at that point, when we got first got quarantined, I noticed, I mean, we all know what the deer gauntlet is between here and Pawnee, right? It's the Glen Arm Road. You go down that valley, I mean, that's where we both have hit those deers. I've seen 50 deer, 30 on this side of the road and 20 more over here making their way to the lake to do so. I don't know, they're all over. I mean, like, it gets to a point where I'm driving, I'm down to 30 miles an hour, I'm just watching. And <clears throat> I just started noticing I wasn't seeing any deer seen no deer. Still haven't seen no deer. It's been three months. I have not seen. She sees them. I don't see them. Everybody else says, oh yeah, I still see them all the time over there. Not where I'm expecting to see them. Not seeing my royal blue purplish colors of the presence when the Holy Spirit's really tap, tapped into me. And, and so I, I started really asking and questioning God about this. I said, what's going on? He says, he told me that David, when he was a shepherd boy, was the furthest away from God in his point of life. That I mean, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They had the Holy Spirit mantle put on them. The Spirit of God was placed on them. 
at the times that he needed to be on them. But when he was being developed, he learned without having to depend on that mantle being on him. He learned how to depend and trust and release faith into God without knowing if his presence was really there or anything else. Most of those patriarchs did, right? And so the Lord told me that he was really, he's, he's, he's looking for his warriors. You said something the other night. You, you called, I, I, well, at least I took it. You called me a warrior. And it kind of sealed the deal for what he was doing. And, and, and I don't boast in that, you know. But I get caught up in this stuff, and it's e easy. And I talked about this on one of the virtual uh, meetings that, you know, if we don't be careful, we watch what's going on in this world. We can lose our, our hearing. We can go deaf in hearing what the Spirit of God has to say. Because your emotions will start taking over. Your car, carnal mind will start taking over. Your flesh will start taking over. And what does the word say? We're not to be led by our carnal mind or our emotions or our flesh. We're to be led by the Spirit of God. If you're letting your mind soak up what's going on, you know, I find myself looking at this stuff, and I want to get, I want to get a group of people, let's just grow, let's go down there and let's go to war, man, let's go. That's just the way I am. It's the way I, my makeup is, you know, I see all the bikers get together and want to go down there and protect all the statutes and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I want to go with them, you know. Now I see there's a movement going. Uh, it's it's, it's the, the blue and back the blue, yeah. Police. I mean, people that support the police and all that. They're 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 starting to show up at these protests and strong forces, thousands of them, American flags, pro, you know. Non stop the nonsense because there's no sense of what's going on right now. So it's nonsense. But I don't want to miss God. Getting caught up, getting my mind pulled into the carnality of all that. And it's easy. We all do. watch the news for five minutes. You'll 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 hear what I'm saying. What is God preparing us to do? Happening to a lot. Like that further had compassion, but seeing the cover, um, the, the Muslims that are sadly escaped their children, the fear of turns to hate, and the sadness and hurt, that's one of her emotions and to have compassion and unconditional love for that person, despite their religious beliefs and or the way they look at you. Good company. Um, and I agree, and and I believe that I believe the Lord was to develop us into warriors. You know, I don't mean the physical warriors, but we have a power and authority established in us that is like nothing other, nothing else. Okay. Yeah. And so we can't be caught up in, 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 I mean, we need to be doing spiritual warfare. The, the songs I, put, I picked today were by the Holy Spirit. There's, there is a sound of warring drums. There should be in our hearts right now, you know, because we are coming to these times, these perilous times, you know. Um, now, again, I'm, uh, my question is, and it's not a literal question, it's, it's pretty much the title of my sermon, what are we being prepared for? <laughs> uh, I started reading uh, um, 
in, in Isaiah for whatever reason, you know, you know how we all are. I, I start reading a chapter in the Psalms and a chapter in Isaiah. I'm tired of being in the New Testament, so I'm going to go to the Old Testament for a while. You, you ever better do that? <laughs> He's like, I'll go over here for a while. And so uh, this came up in the other day, and, and it, it was the day we had prayer. And I started reading in this chapter. I'm going to start with, uh, it's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And I'm in the New King James. Um, I read this first verse. I've read this many, many, many times. And I always think the way I think most of us think when we read it. So I'll just read it real quick. Verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Okay. So I guarantee anybody that's ever read this famous, it's one of the popular scripture. Okay. Every one of us have always read it, and the first thing we do is we just think about the fulfillment of that in Jesus. But God started showing me something. He wants to show us the fulfillment of us in the same thing. Verse 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. That's obviously talking about the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, coming through Jesse, David, you know, so on and so forth. But here we are. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay, so his roots is obviously the Messiah, Jesus. He's what comes up out of the stem of Jesse. The branch that comes out of the root is the church. It's the body. John 15, 5 says that I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay? I don't, we don't need no more proof than that, really, but there's a lot more. Uh, the root in Revelation 5, 5 states that Jesus is the root of David, who is the son of Jesse. Okay, so there's no mistake. We know what the root is. We know what the branch is. Um, let's go to John 17. If you have your Bibles, if not, write it down. Study at home. Verse 20 through 26. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just, I pray as I read this word, Father God, it just, it just in, it embeds itself in the heart of your people, Father God. They, it'd be like a piercing arrow of your wisdom and knowledge through your love that just pierces their, their very core. It's your word, not go in vain, Father God. Verse 20, chapter 17. Jesus praying for all believers. And he just got done praying for himself. He began to pray for his disciples, and now he's going to pray for all of us, everybody that ever would come to believe in him. He says, I do not pray for these alone, disciples and himself, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You know, I wrote a song once that God gave me a word. Uh, it, you know, it's not just by believing in him that we, we have what God says we'll have in him, but it's our commitment to him that he commits to us. He's a gentleman. He never forces anything on anybody. He gave us the gift of free will. But I guarantee at 38 years old, when I committed to him, I just knew that I knew he just committed himself to me. <laughs> oh, let me show you something, son. You just made a right move. And I committed to him. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, we just sang that tonight, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you will have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundations of the world. It says in the Bible that when he shows up in his glory, that we 
will be with him in that glory. That's the body of Christ. There's still going to be people living when that happens. Living and walking. Breathing on this earth. Living when that happens. When he shows up in his glory, we will show up with him in his glory. Um, he's showing a oneness. I'm trying to, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this all together. Connecting the dots. He is the root. And a branch will come out of his root. His body. We are one with him. Jesus prayed this prophetically. That we would be one with him. Ephesians 1.22. You've heard me preach this one. I'm going to do it again. I, I, I still run into a lot of the people in the church. That just don't really have a revelation. Of what this is all about. And why God has chosen us. For a royal priesthood. As a holy nation. As a special people. I still like the cube. Doesn't change. Ephesians 1, verse 22. And he, God, put all things under his feet, Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him for who fills all in all. What is the fullness of Jesus? The head. Everybody that ever believed and received and had. Everybody that believes and receives and has. Him. Everybody who will believe, receive, and have. We are the building blocks of the temple of the living God. We talked about that in Bible study today. It is not a house made with hands anymore. It is us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's not dwelling in a tent that we erect every time God moves us. He's not found on a mountain except the Mount Zion. You are Mount Zion, the church. We are his fulfillment. Jesus is not fulfilled as who he is for whom God had sent him to be and what to do. To, be, to build in this dispensation of time, in this grace period. He's not complete until God says, go get him and puts him together. Right now, he's a head without a body and we're a body without a head. I mean, if you wanted to look at it that way, we know that we're one. We have a head. It's all spiritual. Back to Isaiah. I just want to show the oneness of the branch and the root. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. He's developing in us a warrior mentality for these days. We have to have a warrior mentality to allow ourselves to be constructed and built up and, and, and brought to this place where we have revelation of who we really are in Christ Jesus. I speak about it all the time because I think it's imperative because we're living in the, what I believe is the end of this dispensation of grace. I, I, I ministered and said that I also believe that, um, um, what is it he says when in, in the... Uh, I what I was say. Um, oh, the what is it of the Gentiles that he talks about in the times when before he comes? The what? Yeah, the fulfillment of the Gentiles, but there's something else. Um, anyway, I believe we're at the end of that time. Uh, we're we're gonna about to be ushered into the next dispensation. And, and in that dispensation, before that can happen, I believe that the church, you've heard me say this, is going to be used to do greater works. Jesus said it, I did. He says, you will do greater works. Greater works. And, and so I believe there's going to be a time where before he takes us home and fulfills himself with us and us with him, that we will be, the anointing in us will be activated and charged by resurrection power to do those greater works. 
People are supposed to become, they'll come running to the hope of glory they see in you. They'll want what you have. You will truly be in a full manifestation of healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out devils, raising the dead, freely it was given to us. I'm telling you, people will be sniffing you out to have what you got. So I'm trying to let you know that we have to understand what Isaiah is saying here prophetically about the Messiah, but that includes us. Because now we know. We can look past and see what he did, why he came, right? So now let's read this a little different way. <clears throat> there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. We know that to be the Messiah. So now we got a name for the Messiah, Yahshua, Jesus. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, the branch being the body, the church. So <clears throat> let's look at what's waiting for us in fulfillment, in the fullness of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon us. Because we are him and him is we. Right? The spirit of wisdom will rest on us. The spirit of understanding will rest on us. The spirit of counsel will rest on us. The spirit of might will rest on us. The spirit of knowledge will rest on us. And the spirit of the fear, the reverence, the respect of the Lord will rest upon us. Now, you hear it that way. That doesn't mean this is what we get. This is what people will see. They will see it resting on us. Because there will still be people living. The spiritual realm and the, and the physical realm will be one together again, like it was in the beginning. The Spirit of God used to walk with Adam and Eve. This is what it's going to be like when Jesus, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how, <clears throat> what it will be like when he comes in, the, in his fullness of his second coming. Not the first phase, not when he connects his body with his self. But when he comes back to establish his kingdom, his millennial reign on earth, with all his kings and lords with him. Because that's why we call him the king of kings and the lord of lords. We're not talking about kings and lords in this realm. We're talking about you. All of us will be kings. We'll be assigned as kings for kingdoms, lords with lordships, priests for priesthoods. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon us. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord will rest upon us too because the body and the head are one in the fullness of this time. This is after that happens in his fullness. He comes back to establish his kingdom on earth. Revelation 4. 4. Revelation 4, 4, let's go, let's just go to 1. <clears throat> John has been called to come up to heaven, caught up, the Latin word for that is rapture, but we'll just keep with the English, because people tend to get all upset about the rapture, I don't know why. Fascinated me when I first got saved. I was 38 years old. God gave me all these dreams and stuff. And I hadn't even read Revelation. And I just, well, I thought everybody just thought the same about this. But man, you talk about division. Rapture's not even in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. So he was caught up. He was told to come up. He did. And he was in heaven. He was looking at what was to be. He says, me that I was in the spirit, behold, a throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne, and, and I'm in verse 3, and he who sat there was like jasper and sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald, and around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That is the seven spirits of the Lord. It is the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord.
24 elders. Uh, my note here says, and I don't just always go by the notes, but I like the way it's worded here. It says that uh, the 24 elders are the celestial representations of all the redeemed, the glorified and enthroned who worship continuously. You know, further on in the book of Revelation, you see that it is those who are in heaven that are clothed, describing the body of Christ, describing the church, those who are already there, not those who haven't been there yet, those who came by way of uh, righteousness in the old covenant and those who came in the righteousness of the new covenant. They're robed with a robe. They're cloaked with a robe dipped in the blood of the Lamb. I hear you pray that all the time. Uh, they're, they're crowned with, with uh, crowns. The, the crowns are uh, what represents the authority that have been established. Maybe it even, I even believe that it says somewhere, it talks about the jewels, the, 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 the very, um, to me it would be like the very, like what a, a, a colonel or an armor, you know, you can tell what rank they are by what they've got, what stripes or whatever. You can tell the same with the crowns, how many jewels they got in them. Uh, that some might be, you know, the fullness for kings, some might be the fullness for lordships or priesthoods or whatever. But anyway, that's my own that's my own thinking there. But it does describe the the, the people of heaven at that time, which at that point can be those redeemed by righteousness in the old covenant, and those redeemed by righteousness in the new covenant, represented by the the twelve tribes of Israel. It says twenty four thrones and and the twelve disciples of Christ. Representing the old covenant righteousness and the new covenant righteousness. Um, what are we being prepared for? It's so much more than we can ever, ever fully understand right now in these human bodies with a human mind. But we can trust in the Word of God what it says about us. And when deep calls in the deep, God promises you, he'll give you revelation of those mysteries. The whole fact that the Messiah came, the whole thing, everything leading the Messiah up to the cross was a mystery that was revealed to you and me. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. But we can see it. And so the mysteries revealed is the wisdom of God. It's the wisdom of understanding the places where we would never think ourselves to be. But then he tells us when you put two and two together because the word, listen, we don't need to go around trying to interpret the word. Nobody has a right to interpret the word. Why? The word of God is very capable of interpreting itself. You don't have to. If I'm a branch of Jesus the vine, the root. And he wants me to be one with him as he's one with the Father, and that the Father can be one with me through him. And we are the fullness of Jesus in the completion of Jesus at the end of this age. What age? Age of grace. It's the building time for the, for the new temple. The temple not made with hands. We're each a building block so God can come and be with his people. Well, then that gives us the very right to understand this scripture differently. It's not just a prophetic utterance of Messiah coming. It is a prophetic utterance of who you are and who you're being prepared to be. The New Testament is full of it. Why would we need the mind of Christ? Just to live here and share the gospel? Yeah. But your eternal realm is much more than this realm. Why? It's eternal. This one isn't. We get locked into that. I do. I'm speaking. I feel, I feel like I'm very average with this kind of stuff. You know, I don't think it's a dangerous thing to be alone with me in my head. Because I think it's very common. I think sometimes I just say the things that people do think. And if you don't, well, I know, maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. But the fact is, is that I, I'm getting to understand that if what we're being prepared for is not just for our time here now. It is uh, we are set apart people for eternity. We have such an honor, and thank you, to be considered even one hair on Jesus' arm. But we are. 
He loves us that much. And yeah, while we're being developed, we're to spread the gospel. Because God calls all. But not all are going to take it. So, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. We're chosen. This dispensation of grace, we're chosen. He knew this. I've told you. He, he had a book with your name in it before the universe was even there. My gosh. I mean, it's in his courts. In his courts are books. And in those books are each and every one of your hairs on your head. He knew it first and foremost. And we get to go in that courtroom through the gates of thanksgiving and with the courts of praise. We get to go in there and come in, a, come in agreement with his will. Come in agreement to declare the, the decrees he's already made about us. Amen. He's just waiting for us to do it. He's wanting us to come in here and declare yes. what he's already written about us in his books. I don't know you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. By the way, Father. Go ahead and just read it. What is it? Luke what? Luke 21. Uh, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, knowing that its desolation is near, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. For these days are the days of vengeance, and all, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, woe to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Yeah. It's still not the one I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's close. There's another one in Romans 11. No, it's, I know it's what Jesus says. It's, uh, it's about, I, I think it's in probably Matthew 24. Um, Uh, it's talking about when they were asking him, you know, when he will come and all that, and what do we got to go through? Oh, beginning of sorrows. That's what. Sorry about the Gentiles. Thing. Uh, it's right there. He goes. Uh, he they ask they ask him in Matthew twenty four. They ask him a couple two part question. Uh, they call this the Mount of Olives discourse. It talks about pretty much. He gives it in a in a in a statement about. Uh, when he's going to come back, what's going to happen before his coming, and he, he answers a two-part question. When was it, when was, you know, he was, they were going to destroy the temple. He, he fulfilled that. I mean, thousand, he's back a thousand on his prophecies. Uh, the temple was destroyed, and then he talks about uh, the Jews in this, you know, and he says that when, uh, before he says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars, rumors of wars, see that you're not in trouble, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence. This one is a doozy right now. I think the name of this, like I said, I think the name of this pestilence is BS. But anyway. And earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So what I was trying to say, because I lost my train of thought on that, is that we, I believe that we are at the end of the beginning of sorrows. <laughs> so, in other words, these things we all know as Christians have to come, have to happen. And it's the work of our enemy. I see what's I see. Yes, sir. Um, I was just going to point out, um, I believe that when uh, the Bible refers to nations, it's referring to races. It's not talking about governments. It's talking about the different races, the different nations. Good. So that's right what? in line with what the na nations will rise up against nations. Races will rise up against races. A lot of times I read the word nation in the Bible, and, it, and, and footnote says the actual Hebrew word will be Gentile, not Jew. Because to them... You know, it's funny. I was, I was, uh, I've been. My wife corrected me once because I, I, we watched the news while we we're exercising in the bedroom, and I, I, mean, I get caught up in it. But I'm, I'm, I've also been told by God to watch, and I do. I watch the scrolls on the bottom because I'm always trying to pay attention to what's going on with Israel. 
So now I got better sites on my phone that I can go to get better information. But you know, we got the TV on. I'm always scanning those scrolls that always are going by. You know, that's going on elsewhere besides what their headlines are. And uh, but anyway, I, I they were talking about something that I mis I, I misused the word race racist. And she finally corrected me. She goes, you said that a couple of times, but you're not using the word correct. And I always tell her, she feel free, you know, correct me. I, I, I just don't know sometimes. I, and so what it did is it caused me, uh, it caused me to kind of research the word a little bit more. And I got deeper and deeper and I came to this one, uh, I mean, you can get deep, you can get into the Hebrew word where, because you try to look up race in the Bible and all this stuff. And anyway. It got me. It got me real deep, and it came to the conclusion. I came to the conclusion that it's almost impossible. Dumb is dumb that you even call anybody a racist. There is no race but one in in people. Your colors have nothing to do with it. You know, in a litter of puppies, you might have a black, white, brown, and whatever puppy. They're still all dogs. Their race is dog. Not brown, black, or white, or polka dot. We're the human race. And so the further I, I even research it, everybody is, is being ignorant. I mean by choice, or they just don't know. So they're either stupid or ignorant, I guess, that, that they're misusing the word I wasn't. <laughs> Confuse them because they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't disperse. Out. Yeah, when, when, they, when they got out of the ark, they were supposed to, to fill the earth and spread out, but they did, and they came together in this big socialist society at the Tower of Babel, and God stepped in and made them change and confuse the, the, the languages. But it, it occurred to me, you know, one of the things that is the uh, depiction of the end of the time, the end will come, is when the, the gospel is preached to all the nations. Well, again, I came to the conclusion that um, if anybody has a right to be offended, it's all the animals because we have no, we're misusing that term. We really are. We're all just people. We're human beings. And I just think it's uh, ironic and funny at times and serious at times. And just, you know, and again, I see. You know, I was talking to one of our guys in church today, and you know, for if you study end times, you know that uh, in the in the seven year tribulation that John prophesied about, the seventieth week of Daniel, um, we know that there's going to be a ruler, antichrist, false prophets, that are going to be dictating everything. Now, do you seriously think we're in a state right now where a world leader could govern or take over the United States and we would just say, okay, mm. the heart of this nation, you know, although it's getting divided, yeah. the heart of this nation will do what they got to do. We'll fight. Yeah. And we're, we're free people. We, we promote freedom and you, you ain't telling us what. No. But... If certain groups in our nation would have it their way, we would submit. You know, 
communist, socialism, all those things are what it takes to listen to a world dictator. According to what it says in the book of Revelation and all the prophets about the end times and that dictator, that, that false Christ, that false prophet, we are going to have to be submitted to that. And right now, this nation will not do it. We'll, we'll die first. But if, if it gets to the point where we have a, an agenda that's out there right now and making itself known for really publicly for the first time, really, it's really out there, that people want to be governed like that, that politicians want to govern like that, I mean, they would have no problem bowing down at the time of the rise of the, uh, the abomination of desolation, the one that Daniel prophesies about that says, you can worship me now. You know, we'll get it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing right now. We, we, we are, don't think that America, can't, America, although right now this instance, I don't think we could. But there's coming a time where this nation is going to have to be not a problem for the Antichrist. It's like a chess game, or a chess game, you know. He's playing. He knows. He knows the whole plan. He knows. And, you know, he even knows the end story, I think. But he, what his intention is, is I'm going to, I'm going to, what, what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fool them. I'm going to get as many as I can. I'm going to deceive as many as I can. That's what Mitch was saying. We've got to be very careful because it's all over talking about, uh, you know, warning us. Our brothers, our patriarch, our forefathers are warning us not to allow deceit. We have a guidance. We have the word of God that interprets the word of God. Just believe it for what it is. It is what it is. It's going to happen. It's, gonna, it's batting a thousand up to this point, unfulfilled prophecy. I'm pretty sure it's going to continue that, that, that average. So, what are you being prepared for? And this time I'm seeing right now, when I look at heavier into the spirit and try to lean into the spiritual side of this, there's a calling going on. There's a trumpet being sounded right now. Deep cries unto deep. You know, it's, it's, it's not funny you said that, but uh, remarkably you said that. Um, you know, the word there for, it, when we're called, I think it's in the Psalms, we pray for the shalom of, of Jerusalem. Uh, the word shalom there, one of its main ingredients is salvation. Peace actually means salvation. Uh, so we do, we need to be praying for the salvation Jewish people because they're they're caught up in a, a lot of them are caught up in uh, a, a with a religious spirit. Yeah. You know. But uh, I just want to say one of the things in the way in this four months or however long it's been for me, uh, my I've been to a test that is my faith can be wavered in these dry times where I couldn't see His presence. I couldn't. 
you know, it wasn't as obvious as it was for me. I told you the colors I see and then, and all those things. And, and at first I was like, man, God, what am I doing? What's, what's the sin? Reveal to me the sin I'm doing that's keeping you from blah, blah, blah. Did I, did I, uh, you know, did I blaspheme the Holy Spirit or what? <laughs> you know, and I think just me asking God I blaspheme the Holy Spirit means I didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But the fact is, is, you know, you, you get that way. You know, I'm like, where's my colors, you know? And, and God would show me I don't have to depend on that. Where's the deer? I, yeah, where's the deer? Where's the, in other words, he's saying, he's saying you don't have to make those things. Those things can turn into law. That's right. That's right. Well, believe me, I had depression and sadness, but the Lord was right there pushing me forward. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't all fun. And, you know, I... I agree, and however that means, however that works for everybody's individual, you know, wherever they're at, God's going to meet them. He's an individual yeah. God to each one of us. We're not all the same. Well, any God is going to sit there and say BS to me, and, you know, that, would, that, that ruffles some religious feathers, but I'm telling you, I, really I believe he does talk to me that way. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. I, I pray that people uh, have gotten something out of this. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, your Holy Spirit will grow in each and every yes. one of us wherever we're at, preparing us for an eternal realm with you, Father God. As kings for kingdoms and lords for lordships and priests with priests, I'm excited about our eternity, Father God. And so, Father, help us to be who you created us to be in this womb this, this womb that we are in right now yes, Lord. before we're delivered into our eternal life. Yes, Lord. Help us, Father. Yes, Lord. Help us, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Unleavened bread in which Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent to Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They said. And he said, If you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you and follow him to the house that he enters. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is the great room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And I will show you a large upper room. I'll furnish to make preparations there. And they left and they had found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared for the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and disciples reclined at the table and said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until I find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Um, I had the opportunity this past Easter because Catherine had to actually perform Seder as part of her, her college. And so as we're going through this, we were talking about all the different cups. There are basically, basically four cups in the Seder. There's a fifth one if you actually, it's the cup of Elijah, if you don't drink out of it. But the four cups are this. The first one is the cup of Kadush. Kadush is this. It says, I will bring you out. The second cup is the cup of forgive. And it means that I will deliver or that I will rescue. The third is the Bakat Hamazam, which means I will lead you. This is traditionally the third cup that we think that Jesus lifted when he gave the communion ceremony that we do today. And the fourth is the cup of Halal, or the cup of praise, the cup of I will love God, because it says that I will save you. So as you think about this, I want you, we always skip to the third cup, the cup of redemption, which is the representation of that slain lamb, the blood that was that was poured over his lentils so that the, the death would, would pass over those that were redeemed. But let's think about the first two cups this time. The cup of Kadush and the cup of Megid. 
So that, that cup of Kaddush, what, what, what is God bringing you out of? What, what are you in right now that God needs to bring you out of? That second cup, the cup of Yid, what is God rescuing you from? And if we think past over those first two cups that are done on that Seder as we do our communion, but I think they're just as important as the cup of redemption because if you don't go to those first two cups, how do you know that you've been delivered? You haven't passed through and understood that you had to be bought out of something and you had to be rescued from something. So as we take this communion cup today, I want you to think about those things. What is God bringing you out of? What is he rescuing you from? And on that night, Jesus took the bread. He broke it. Thank you. 